Good morning, everyone. My talk would be on posterior column fractures of the tibial plateau. How to decide and formulate your surgical strategy will kind of form the focus of my talk. So when you say posterior column fractures, by definition, you are using the three column classification proposed by Luo Kong Fan way back in 2010. And as per his classification, the area shaded in yellow would constitute the posterior column of the tibial plateau. To get fractures in this column is quite rare compared to other parts of the proximal tibia, but you can see posterior column fractures occurring as part of a multi-column injury very commonly. If you look at the injury mechanism of these fractures, they are typically shear injuries causing compression failure of the posterior part of the proximal tibia with the knee inflection. This will typically result in coronal fracture lines on the proximal tibia with fragments having posterior apices and depressions which tend to present on the lateral side, predominantly in the posterior aspect. And how do we treat these fractures? If you have an isolated depression on the posterolateral aspect, which is more common than the posteromedial aspect, these fractures can be accessed from the anterior-based approach indirectly. It may not be always possible, but this is one strategy that can be employed most of the time. But if you have a fracture that, is, that has resulted in disruption of the posterior cortical margins, then you need direct manipulation to achieve your reduction and also buttress that fragment from the posterior side in order to stabilize it as uh, you would desire. If you look at the fracture patterns that can occur on the posterior column, you can have isolated posterolateral fragments, posteromedial fragments with or without dislocation patterns, and sometimes you can have the entire posterior column fracture. If you look at posteromedial fractures, this is a simple posteromedial fracture pattern. And if you have such a fracture, how would you treat surgically? Would you go supine or would you go prone? I would agree most of us would tend to go supine on this one, but why? What are the advantages of going prone or supine and what are the limitations? If you look at the prone lob and offer approach, this was described to treat isolated posteromedial condyl fractures. And you can also use it for certain types of fracture dislocation patterns. This is done prone. It offers you a direct posterior access to your fracture area. Reduction is quite easy because this is done in extension. So these fractures typically reduce in extension so you can get a good reduction on that. And you achieve or you assess your reduction based on the apex and also rely on fluoro to make sure you have reduced your articular segment anatomically. But what are the caveats here? If you're doing a prone lob and offer approach, you have to remember that there is no direct articular access on this one. So if you need an articular access, you are kind of lost. And also if you have a comminuted apex, sometimes you cannot rely on apical reduction and you have to make sure you've got your articular surface reduced anatomically. Also clamp options are limited especially if you have not positioned your patient correctly. Postocentral depressions can be dealt with through this approach. I'm not saying no, but I believe it is much more easy to do this one in a supine position. So there are positional limitations as well. So if you look at the patient that I showed in the previous slide, of course, this patient underwent fracture fixation through a prone lob and offer approach because this is kind of like amenable to that. And we fix this uh, fracture by using a strong buttress plate from the posterior aspect. And you can see the reduction is anatomical and she went on to heal well. So when should we avoid going prone? So since most of these fractures are done in supine position, so you need to know when you should avoid going prone. So these are my indications for not going prone on these fractures. So when you have a commented apex, when you have postocentral depressions as part of fracture dislocation patterns, and also in fractures where you need articular access, for example, if you have the medial column fractured as well, then you do not have a great read or a reference to base your posterior middle fragment upon. So these are the indications for me to definitely go supine on the posterior medial side. And that is what was done for all these three cases. As you can see, as most of us would have probably done. And if you look at cases one and three required articular access, to get a reduction for us. Case one, because there was an intervening uh, osteochondral fragment that was not allowing us to get an articular reduction. 
and case three because the anteromedial rib was broken. So supine exposure gives you uh, the liberty to go and do an arthrotomy anterior to the MCL and get your cortical, sorry, articular reads uh, matched and then you can achieve your reduction. So how would I do a posteromedial fragment fixation? So the first step is to address any postocentral depressions if you have as part of the fracture pattern and then get your articular reduction either based on apex if you require an articular access, go again, expose it directly and reduce it. And then clamp your fracture patterns and then anterior posterior lax screws at the subchondral level to achieve and secure your articular reduction. And once you have done that, all these things are done in extension. So then now you can bring your leg into flexion and complete your fixation. So what about postolateral fractures? There are different patterns ranging from pure depressions to splits and split depressions. And these might have an eye or a low apex. I will come back to that, what I mean by that. You can also have the entire posterior column fractured, or you can have the posterolateral fragment as part of a multi-column fracture. And depending on the fracture pattern, you will plan your surgical approach and operative strategy. So if you look at this middle-aged male, he's got a kind of posterolateral split depression injury. And if you look at the rim, it is quite undisplaced and the apex is also quite high above the fibular head. So in this case, we chose to treat him as a kind of a pure depression coming from the anterior side, neglecting the posterior cortical rim injury. So this is intraoperatively, as you can see, he's got significant instability on the lateral side. And you can see the uh, uh, operative images, the spike is around the posterior lateral corner. And if you look at the sutures, the blue uh, sutures are tagging the meniscus and my vicral purple one is tagging the lateral collateral ligament. And once you have secured these structures, you can go again around the postural corner, elevate your depression. It gives you reasonable amount of exposure into the articular surface. I won't say it's great, but most often enough to do your approach, do your fixa reduction and fixation. So once you've got your reduction, and this is what was done, fixation by using a hoop plate, this is called an extended anterolateral or a suprafibular approach as described by the Korean colleagues. And this is how we ended up fixing it, restoring uh, the articular congruity and stability to that knee. So if you look at this example, you can see the uh, posterolateral depression as well as the posterior or the lateral rim broken. You can also see the fracture extending into the lateral column as well, and it's got a medial break as well. So if you look at this fracture with the postolateral rim broken, this patient requires a direct buttress of the postolateral rim. So you need direct exposure of that. If you have fracture only on the postolateral side, then you can access it by a direct postolateral approach. But in this case, you require to access both columns. So we did a frosh, and the first step is to reduce and secure your postolateral fragment with a small T buttress plate and then come back through the lateral window and complete your anterolateral fixation by using a stronger buttress plate. And this is what it looks like immediately post-op and he went on to heal well in spite of us not uh, addressing the medial side. So it, it is important to remember that not all postulateral fragments can be accessed from the lateral side. So in certain fracture patterns, when you have the apex that is running low or too medial, then you need a different approach to treat this once because whatever you can see in the blue zone is what you can access from the postolateral side because anything lower than that is quite difficult because you have the anterior tibial artery uh, crossing your field and you cannot make this approach more extensive. side. So in these patterns and also in patterns when you have the entire posterior column broken where you have postomedial and postolateral fragments, then the approach of choice here would be the reverse L approach as described by Luo Kong Feng in his landmark paper in 2010. So if you look at this case, this is a typical example of an entire posterior column fracture. You can see two fragments, postomedial, postolateral, as well as a postolateral central depression. And this is how we position the patient, though Kong Feng Luo described it in his floppy lateral position, we prefer to do it in prone. So the patient is uh, portion prone with bolsters under the thigh so that the tibia is floating. So that if I need access to the medial column or I need to clamp my fractures, I find this easier to do. So the first thing is to get your post central depression correct and then stabilize it and then go ahead and uh, reduce the cortical rims and fix it as you have shown here. So 
the, what are the caveats of this approach? Uh, two, I would say, like, because if you go from the post medial side, you do not have far lateral access. So if you have access in the blue zone, best would be to approach it from the lateral side. And whatever approach, either the post lateral or the post medial or the reverse L, to me, does not offer a great uh, articular access. So most often, these approaches are used for stabilizing the cortical rim fragments, and then articular work is done predominantly from the anterior side. What do you need to do if you want to do want want you want to look into the articular surface? So if you really want to look into the articular surface for whatever reasons, then you need to do an osteotomy, either osteotomy of the lateral femoral epicondyle or the fibula head. So we used to do a lot of fibular head osteotomies, but we kind of gave it up over a period of time in favor of the frosh. But whenever we need to do an osteotomy, yes, we can go ahead and do a, either of these. They offer a great exposure. If you look at Frosch's paper and most of his subsequent papers, he looks or like he uses the post lateral window to fix the fracture. He doesn't visualize the articular segment through that. He uses an osteotomy to visualize the articular surface. So how to choose your surgical approach when you deal with a post struggle fragment? So these are my kind of criteria. So if you have a fracture that is located far laterally, you have an apex that is within three centimeters of the joint line, if you have an associated postolateral depression, then probably postolateral approach is better to do than the reverse L approach. For other fracture patterns, it would be the reverse L approach. So in summary, posterior column fractures in isolation are easy to do. Multi-column fractures require careful planning. Read your CT carefully and plan your surgical approaches so that you don't need more than two approaches. We have definitely got better at dealing with these fractures right now. We have reproducible and extend, less extensile approaches which can be combined safely without major problems. Thank you.